This last year, we've taken a look at what it means to be a missional church, to be a gathering of believers sent into the world to demonstrate the kingdom by making friends, meeting real needs, and giving God credit. We spent this last summer in perspectives talking about the great commission for us as followers of Christ to be sent into the world with, with the good news and to demonstrate that in the ways we, things we do and the things we say. In this series for the next four weeks, we're going to take a look at what it looks like for us to do personal evangelism. When I say evangelism, uh, that sends a shudder up some of your spines. It does me. When I, you say evangelism, we're talking about evangelism, I think, oh, no. In this series, we want to take a look at what it looks like to be sent, not just around the world, but sometimes just across the room, to engage someone, to share with them the hope that we have in Christ. I hope that through this series, we have a new understanding of some simple steps for us to share our faith in very natural ways with the people that we love the most. This series is based on a book that's been written by Bill Hybels, who's the pastor at Willow Creek Community Church outside of Chicago, one of the largest churches in the world. And uh, it's been on his heart to develop a, a book that helps people understand personal evangelism that isn't just for spiritual superstars, but for all of us that we could share in very natural ways. Listen to Bill as he uh, shares his passion for this concept. Listen to this. A lot of people I talk to get all freaked out when they hear the word evangelism. They think they have to master this massive amount of apologetic information. They think they have to have a different personality than God gave them. They think that uh, it's just some formidable challenge that they could never rise to. And so often I find that it's the, the short, rather accessible little steps or walks or deeds that you do. It's not giving long speeches. It's mostly about friendship. It's not backing someone into a corner. It's just kind of pointing to Christ in ways that are natural for you. And I think if more people would do just the small thing that they can do, Take a walk here, stretch out an arm here, say a word here, live your faith every day in a humble and kind of genuine way. I think a lot of people would find that they would be uh, touching a lot more lives than they think. If we were just to do the little things, that's what we want to talk about in the next few weeks. I want to tell a story that, uh, read a story that Bill Hybels talks about that gave him the concept for just walk across the room. He was at a, a breakfast, a prayer breakfast, uh, with uh, business people, leaders, and, and around the table were seated different people, and as they introduced themselves, he noticed the African-American man across the table who introduced himself with a Muslim-sounding name, which seemed odd to him that he was at a Christian prayer breakfast with a man across the table with a Muslim-sounding name. And as he introduced himself across the table, the man mouthed to him, I love your books and looking back to see if there was a famous author behind him, <laughs> looked back and said, let's talk later. So after, when there was a break, he had an opportunity to engage him in conversation. He says, I bet you're wondering why I have a Muslim name and why I'm here at this prayer breakfast. He says, well, let me tell you a story. He says, I was at a business gathering, a cocktail party for my, uh, for my uh, industry, and I was standing by myself. I live in the South, and, and um, it's odd for... Uh, African-American man with a Muslim name in my industry in the South uh, at these gatherings. So I often find myself with a drink in my hand and a plate in the other and no one talking to me. I'm usually up against the wall and I stay there long enough to, to uh, have made a showing and then I usually go home. And I noticed across the room there was a man who was in a group of friends and he saw me, caught my eye, and he walked across the room. He took 10 steps over to me and engaged me in conversation and showed an interest in my Muslim faith. When he found out I was a Muslim, he said, you know, I would really like to meet with you and find out more about your faith system. And so they began meeting for coffee week after week, and this man was a Christian, and he was asking this Muslim man to explain to him what his faith was all about. And then here's, here's where the story picks up. He says, one week, and this is the African-American Muslim man speaking, one week, I even took the opportunity to ask him about his beliefs. I'd been a Christian as a kid, but left God, left the faith, left it all because the church my family attended was so racially prejudiced. 
I want to know part of that Christianity. When the tables turned and I was on the receiving end of his faith story, he patiently described why he'd given his whole life to this person named Jesus Christ. I couldn't believe how easily the conversations evolved and how respectfully and sensitively he conveyed his love of God. Despite our deep-seated religious differences, we were becoming fast friends. It went on this way for some time as we'd meet to hash through nuances of our faith experiences. Sometimes he would ask for a couple of days to find answers to my questions. Other times he knew exactly where I was struggling and seemed to have the perfect words to untangle my confusion. There finally came a day, I remember being home alone when this happened, that I felt totally compelled to pray to God. I kneeled beside my bed, told God everything I was feeling, in the end gave my life to Jesus Christ. And in the space of about a week, that single decision changed everything in my world. Every single thing. It's really what we all want. We want to be able to share what's most important to us, our faith in Christ. We want to be able to share that with people that we love, people we work with, we go to school with. We talk about that all the time, but how do we do it? How do we begin to be in a position where we can simply take a walk across the room to share what really is the single greatest gift that we could give to anyone? The single greatest gift in your outline says, the single greatest gift Christ followers can give to the people around them is an introduction to the God who created them, who loves them, and who has a purpose for their lives. Evangelism is simply constantly watching for opportunities, ways to give away the single greatest gift. Evangelism is constantly watching for ways to give away the single greatest gift to someone who doesn't know God. So this week, we want to begin four weeks of us discovering together how God might use us. And the first way that God uses us is to be willing to enter the zone of the unknown. And this story that I just read for you illustrates this first point. Be willing to enter the zone of the unknown. We all know what it's like to stand in a circle of comfort, right? We all can picture ourselves in a circle of comfort, either on the patio or at work or at a party. We know what that's like to enter into and to uh, be comfortable. It's easy to relate. It's easy to converse. There's nothing unsafe about it. The circle of comfort is a place where we hang out a lot, right? So if you were to, in your, in your bulletin, you have a circle there. That's our circle of comfort. In the story, we saw that there was someone who was standing outside of that circle of comfort. So put an X out to the side of that circle. In the story, the Christian man saw someone outside of the circle of comfort. Someone who needed a friend, someone who needed a little encouragement. Not only did he look and see that person there, but he also heard something. He heard a nudge, a, a voice that said, walk across the room. He actually left the people he was standing with, said, you know, excuse me a minute. And he walked across the room. So take a, 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 make a, a line with an arrow that goes from the circle out to the X. When we're willing to enter the zone of the unknown, we don't know what's going to happen next. We don't know what's going to happen in that conversation. We don't know where it's going to lead. We don't know whether something really miraculous is going to happen or something very mundane. We don't know. But that's what it means to enter the zone of the unknown. What would happen if we were just willing, all of us, were just willing to walk across the room, to step outside of our circle of comfort into that zone. What would that look like? Is it possible that just taking 10 steps across the room to someone that is not in our circle of comfort, what would happen if that walk changed everything in that person's life forever? What if because God prompted us to walk across the room, not only that person's life was changed, but their marriage, their family, their life, their purpose, their eternity was changed because we're willing to leave our circle of comfort. Every one of us, every one of us, regardless of our age or gender or occupation, has the opportunity to walk across the room, to leave those circles of comfort, 
to give the single greatest gift to someone else. Well, when we walk across the room, there's something that we need beyond ourselves. Because I don't know about you, but those times when I think I had to do something, sometimes I, I just mess it up big time. I say something stupid. What God wants us to do is listen for the Spirit's promptings. You know, we talk all the time about the Holy Spirit guiding us. We, we ask for guidance. We ask for insight. We ask for wisdom. When we hear the Holy Spirit say something to us, like, walk across the room. You see that person? Walk to them. Why do we not believe that that's actually the Holy Spirit who's talking to us? Have you ever had that experience? Remember when Amy and I were in Turkey this summer, we were in Istanbul, we got on the ferry to go up the Bosphorus, and we sat down on the, the bench on the outside of the ferry, looking out and uh, eating our fish sandwiches, and, and uh, a, a man sat down next to us, and sat down really close next to us, and uh, began uh, engaging us in conversation. I don't know, for some reason he knew we were Americans, I don't know why, but uh, he began engaging us in conversation, and uh, we got very close to us. He put his hand on my knee, I said, Amy, who is this guy? <laughs> And I'm thinking, you know, maybe he's one of these guides who, who's going to give me all this information and then ask me for money. And I was a little nervous. And when I found out, I said, you know, finding a way to ask him what he did, find out a little about his story. And he turned out to be a major in the Turkish army stationed on the border of Syria uh, dealing with the whole Kurdish problem. Maybe you've heard about that. 25-year <laughs> veteran in the Turkish army. And uh, he spoke English. And his daughter went to the American academy there in Istanbul, and she was going to Boston and New York and Philadelphia this summer, and he engages in conversation, and I, I'm, I'm hearing God say, just find a way to steer this conversation to Christ. So, you know, being a foreigner in a Muslim country, you think, this is a little nervous, I'm a little nervous here. <laughs> and so he asked me what I did, and this is the great thing about being a pastor, is that that in, <laughs> and obviously gets us right in there. Um, <laughs> And so I said, well, pastor, he says, well, what kind of pastor? And I said, well, a Christian pastor. And uh, we began a conversation, and, and we really had a really wonderful conversation uh, on the way up. And then uh, on the way back, we got separated, and Amy and I were down below sitting on some stairs because it was crowded, and he was upstairs. And somebody tapped me on the shoulder, and they said, are you Mike? I said, yeah, I'm Mike. And he said, this guy wants to talk to you. And I look up there, and here's Fred. He called himself Fred, so I could pronounce his name. Here's Fred saying, Mike, come up. Mike, come up. Amy and I went up and talked with him, and the conversation began to go to spiritual things. Conversation started to talk about what's it like to be a Christian in Turkey, and could a Muslim ever become a Christian? Now, I, I'm, I'm going to kind of jump to the end of this story. He didn't become a Christian. And that's not really the point of me telling this. The point is that we hear the Spirit's prompting in our lives. And the question is, are we willing to respond to that prompting regardless of the outcome? Because sometimes God uses us simply to plant a seed. Sometimes we, we take a step and it really bears no fruit whatsoever. And other times we find out, wow, that was really a God-appointed uh, encounter. Are we willing to step outside because God wants us to be in places where we can be useful. Matthew 5 says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Jesus makes the point that followers of Christ are salty. They have a flavor, a savor to them that is unique. And that if the salt loses its flavor, it's not any good, but it's also no good if the salt doesn't come in contact with meat. If it's not in the place where it can add flavor, the salt is of no value. The Holy Spirit moves us into places where we can be used by Him. We want to practice in this series, we want to practice not a technique, but we want to practice being in a relationship with Christ in such a way that we hear his heart beat for people who don't yet know him. And then we're willing to respond by moving outside of our circle of comfort. 
Not all the time. Not every time we're someplace, but sometimes. More of the time, we're willing to commit ourselves to be in those places where God can use us. Get some proximity to people who don't yet know him. Listen for the Spirit's prompting and saying in return, okay, I'll take a walk. Okay, I'll do it. What we don't want to do is just find ourselves barging into other people's conversations. But being in a relationship with God where we can be sensitive to his leading in our lives. See, Jesus gave us an example. In Philippians chapter 2, it says, Have the same attitude of mind Christ Jesus had, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in his appearance as a human being. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. This passage like other passages in the New Testament, describe for us how Jesus took a walk across the cosmos to enter into our world. John says in his first chapter, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That Jesus took a walk across the cosmos to reach out a hand to redeem our lives that otherwise we would have messed up on our own. And also to demonstrate for us what it looks like to set an example for us. Because in the Great Commission, what Jesus is telling us is, go and do what I did. I'm sending you. As the Father has sent me into the world, Jesus says in John chapter 17, so I'm sending you. To walk across the street, walk across the restaurant, walk across the campus, the office, to leave our circle and to follow the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Jesus wants us to follow his example. And so the third point is, just walk. Jesus gives us an example in John chapter 4 of a dramatic encounter that he had with a woman that demonstrates for us what it looks like for us to walk across the room. In John chapter 4, Jesus and the disciples were traveling all day the disciples and Jesus stop at a well where there's a woman. And they all know that this woman is a sinner because she's by herself. She couldn't come out when everyone else was getting water. She had to come out at an odd time of the day, and so she's by herself. And the disciples and Jesus are hungry and thirsty and tired. And the disciples say, Jesus, we're going to go into town and get something to eat. And Jesus says, you know, I'm going to stay right here. That circle of 12 was a circle of comfort. Jesus allowed them to go, and he stayed. And he walked just a few feet across this patch of dust, of dirt, around the well to engage this woman in a conversation. And the conversation is really kind of a, a natural, normal conversation. He sees that she's getting water out of the well, and they begin talking about water. Sir, can I get you something to drink? And he begins... Uh, talking not just about water, but about living water. He turns the conversation that seems just to be a normal conversation about water into living water. And that conversation changed her life. Jesus says to her, everyone who drinks this water will get thirsty again and again. Anyone who drinks the water I give will never thirst, not ever. The water I give will be an artisan spring within, gushing fountains of endless life. The woman said, sir, give me this water so I won't ever get thirsty again. I won't ever have to come back to this well again. She leaves her basin. She runs to the town and tells everyone about Jesus. And the village people come back and they listen to Jesus and they become followers of Jesus. They believe in him. And imagine their conversations 10 or 15 years later as they've gathered together in Christian community. They've heard about the resurrection and they've received the Holy Spirit and, and they're gathered together in this town as followers of Jesus and now their children are followers of Christ. And they're telling stories to each other and say, do you remember how we became followers of Christ? It was that woman who ran to the village and it was Jesus who shared with us what it looked like to have life with God through him. The disciples 
had other things to do besides engage that woman. Jesus took the risk to engage her. And like the disciples, we have a lot of reasons not to engage people who need to know the love and grace of God through Jesus. We're busy people. We're busy doing life. We have appointments, and we have schedules, and we have games, and we have uh, things that keep us busy, and often we just walk right past people. We, we walk right past people and often miss the opportunity to simply walk across the room and perhaps change their lives forever. I want you to think for a moment about the person who walked across the room for you. Think back. Just We've all been thinking of our stories in the last few months. Think about the person who walked across the room for you. I want to give you just a few seconds to think. The person that walked across the room took a risk. Everybody have somebody? Now, for me, I've shared my story with you. That person literally was my mom and my stepdad who walked across our den and asked me if I wanted to follow Jesus. But I want to tell you about somebody else. That same year, my seventh grade basketball coach, Mr. Michelson, Ron, he uh, took a walk across the basketball court, across the campus. He was an English teacher, and he invited uh, several of us in our seventh grade basketball team to a Bible study in his room before school. And we would go there at seven o'clock in the morning every week, and uh, the first thing we ever studied was my heart Christ home, what it meant for us to have Christ in our lives. And Dick later, uh, I called him Dick later, Mr. Michelson, Richard Michelson, Dick would uh, not only be my seventh grade basketball coach, but when I was in high school, a sophomore in high school, he invited me to come to camp. He was a young life leader. And I went with him, and, and I remember that being a significant week for me, understanding really what it meant for me to follow Christ in high school. When I was in college, Dick gave me a phone call and said, would you like to be a young life leader with us? He invited me to be on the team and then taught me how to lead and to lead songs and to give a talk. And that was my first experience in ministry. So here's what I want to do this week. I want to write Dick a, a note and say thank you for walking across the room for me. And I'd like you to ask you to do the same thing. Now maybe the person that you're thinking of is no longer living. Then think about someone who is like that person. Somebody who is willing to take a risk to step out, out of their comfort zone, and to share Christ with someone who needs to hear it. Maybe it's a teacher. Maybe it's a Sunday school teacher. Maybe it was somebody in an office. Write the note to somebody. Say, you remind me of the person who took a walk across the room and changed my life forever. In this series together, I can guarantee us that we're going to grow closer to Christ through this. I also know that we're going to grow closer to each other as we share in our small groups our experience of following the Spirit's prompting and walking across the room, identifying people outside of our circle of comfort. We're going to grow closer to each other. But we're also going to see God do some amazing things as we're willing to listen and respond and step out of our comfort circles into those zones of the unknown where we're not sure what's going to happen and we don't have to manipulate what's going to happen. We can follow the Spirit's prompting and see what God wants to do in us. I want to encourage you to get this book, uh, Just Walk Across the Room, and we're going to be, uh, we're gonna, I'm going to preach a message and then the next week, read a section. So if you already have the book, read the first section. If you don't have it, buy it off Amazon. It's discounted this week, and you'll get it in three days, and begin reading through uh, the first section, and, and allow God to teach us something new about what it means to share our faith. I think this is where we have to grow as, as a growing community of fully devoted followers of Jesus. This is where the leadership of our church has been saying for several years, this is where we have to grow. And it's not going to be because just the, the spiritual superstars take it upon themselves to do what they would have done anyway. It's going to happen because we, as just regular people who don't have the gift of evangelism, are willing to follow God's prompting in our lives and engage people, regardless of the outcome. 
with the hope that perhaps their lives might be changed forever. So let's grow together. Let's learn something new. Let's take some risks. And let's trust God as we do that. I want to encourage you to uh, check our website. We have a button there for fire response. And we want to mobilize as many people as we can. I shared on Thursday night, there was about 1,200 homes that were uh, destroyed. And that's about the same number of people who we'll have in worship at three services. Wouldn't it be great if 1,200 of us gave, prayed, gave of our time and resources, uh, energy, to make a difference in those 1,200 homes? So check, check the website uh, each week and see how we're updating that. We're trying to get news out to you how we can respond. God's calling us to be sent into the world, to leave whatever circle of comfort that we're in. He called us to go, to be sent into the world, to make a difference. We have the privilege to uh, do that in his name. Let's go in the blessing of God the Father Almighty who created you and I to be for the praise of his glory. And the blessing of the Holy Spirit who prompts us to go places we wouldn't go otherwise. And the blessing of God uh, the Son who came for us, who crossed the cosmos, who, who came into our world to redeem us and then to send us out. Let's go with his blessing. Amen.